Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on advances in the chemistry of carbon dioxide capture. My name is Ellen Mantis, and I am the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. For those not familiar with the roundtable, it provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences and engineering, and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are continuing our series of webinars on emerging topics. We launched our series of webinars last year and all presentations and recordings from 2020 are available on the CSR website. Today, we will be reviewing some available technologies for CO2 capture, exploring chemical and engineering challenges and finding improved carbon capture agents and describing some new technology under development. The format will consist of three presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations conclude. Dr. David Myers will be our moderator for this webinar. He is a member of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and Vice President of Specialty Businesses and Strategic Accounts of the Specialty Construction Chemicals Business of GCP Applied Technologies. He will be asking the questions on behalf of the audience. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. The chat feature has been disabled for audience members. For those tuning in via live stream on the CSR website, please submit questions via email. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Reg Raghavir Gupta. Dr. Gupta is co-founder and president of Sustion, which is a technology startup with a mission of development and deployment of low carbon energy technologies to achieve net zero emissions. Dr. Gupta, please go on. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you for everyone for attending it. And I want to thank uh, the Chemical Sciences Roundtable of National Academy of Sciences for uh, this opportunity to participate uh, in this panel discussion. So before, so next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Let's see. Yeah, so I, I got a control. Okay, just, uh, just before I get started in the, on the subject, I just want to give a very brief introduction of Susti on, uh, you know, I've been uh, working in this field uh, for last uh, 30 plus years uh, and three years back, uh, you know, I co-founded Sustion uh, with a couple of my colleagues uh, and to, uh, with the sole purpose of developing and deploying technologies that can significantly reduce greenhouse gases uh, by through disruptive innovations. So this forum is perfect uh, for us to, to talk about it, what those disrupt disruptive innovations could be in CO2 capture and CO2 utilization. And we are also looking at hydrogen production so in, uh, here uh, in, uh, in our company, we basically work very closely with the academic and national labs, Department of Energy, industry and private sector to really see how we can take these innovations and convert them into to deployable technologies. And I think the commercialization and scale up uh, is an important part of our mission. And I'll give you some examples uh, in my presentation. So before I get started on the subject matter, I think most of you are aware of the recent book, uh, which was released last month uh, by Will Gates. And I had an opportunity to read this book, uh, uh, you know, in the last, last couple of weeks. And I think it's pretty, you know, this, this, book, uh, uh, present, uh, this book basically presents a pretty good assessment of the state of uh, affairs today and what we need to do to reach to the net uh, zero because climate change uh, is an existential threat for all of us, uh, for the humanity. And in this book, uh, the way uh, Bill Gates organizes the, the technologies is into five sectors. Uh, how we plug in means how do we produce electricity? Uh, I think which is important for chemical industry because a lot of talk about, uh, you know, electrifying the, the chemical processes rather than using natural gas or other heating media, which generates CO2. How do we make things that's bread and butter for chemical industry, whether we're making ethylene or we're making propylene or we're making ammonia or we're making um, <clears throat> concrete or cement? How do we grow things where ammonia uh, uh, 
when fertilizer industry becomes very important, how do we get around the fuels? Still, most of our transportation sector is dependent on fossil fuels. And I think they are big emitters of CO2. And how do we stay cool and uh, keep cool and stay warm? So I think uh, this pretty much uh, hits a lot of uh, touch points uh, where chemical uh, industry uh, really plays into it. So, so with that background, so basically, what is our really the challenge? I think in uh, worldwide, uh, we emit about 40 gigaton per year of CO2 worldwide, and US is roughly six gigaton. And if you take the total greenhouse gas emissions, which are about 51 gigatons, so we, we have 80% of the greenhouse gases coming from CO2. So to, to basically deal with this problem, we'll have to look at all sources of CO2 and consider all methods of capture uh, utilization storage. There are no silver bullets that one technology can basically solve the problem. And I think the technology has been around for a while. I think one of the reason uh, we have not seen a lot more uh, industrial uh, adaptation of this technology is the lack of regulatory framework. Uh, some of the economic incentives uh, which exist, I think there are 45 Q type uh, incentives, but we need more of them. And also the poor understanding of the CCUS value chain. So this flow chart, flow chart shows a very simplistic uh, uh, picture where you know, we, we emit CO2 in process industry, electricity generation, which everybody knows, you know, steel, cement, uh, and uh, these are what we call point sources. And, uh, and then I also included air, uh, direct air capture, which is, uh, which is now getting more and more attention. So we basically capture the CO2 and I'll talk about some of the technologies which uh, we can use. And once we capture the CO2, we can store it uh, you know, geological sequestration or the enhanced oil recovery, and then a lot of emphasis on CO2 conversion. And for that CO2 conversion, uh, we need, uh, you know, uh, basically carbon-free energy, either hydrogen, electricity, or methane to make products. Uh, and I'll briefly touch upon this, you know. So the next, um, so if you look at the CCS value chain, uh, the capture cost capture is 73% of the problem. So if you look at the, if the CO2 cost, CO2 is $100 a ton. So $73 roughly goes in the capture. About 11% is compression, 3% in the transportation, 8% storage and 5% monitoring, monitoring if you store the CO2 underground. So, so the capture is the largest component where most of the work has been done. Uh, from the R&D and technology side, you know. So I'll talk about that. Uh, so, so if you look at the capture pathways, this is a little bit simplistic uh, chart, but it pretty much dep you know, depicts uh, what we need to do to deal with the CO2. So what I've done is I've divided uh, various uh, pathways where we basically either produce energy or produce chemicals. So if you take the any industrial process uh, <clears throat> where we basically, you know, to make ammonia, methanol, cement, steel. So either we need heat for the reaction or, or carbon is basically an input. And in the end, uh, we need to adjust the hydrogen to CO ratio. So we need to get CO2 out. So, so the number of industrial processes uh, which basically generate CO2 either in the process or just by heating it. Anything we do with the combustion of fossil fuels, whether it's a coal, gas, coal, natural gas, heavy oil, bitumen, uh, we burn it to generate power and heat and we generate CO2. And depending on how we generate, how we, we burn it, uh, the fuel gas can contain five to 15% CO2. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then if we make hydrogen or any other products from natural gas, uh, we basically uh, also capture CO2, what we call it pre-combustion capture because that CO2 is removed before we utilize the, the final fuel or final product. And then uh, there are technologies where we can burn the, the fossil fuel with pure oxygen, we call oxy combustion, and then we essentially make a concentrated stream of CO2. And then the last line I added here in the, in the slide is the direct air, where we could, uh, we could remove CO2, direct air is extreme, the air is a very dilute in CO2, so, so there are separation challenges which I'll touch upon it. So if we look at these pathways, they probably represent about 50 to 60% of the CO2 emitted globally. And, and all fossil-based power, power systems require post-combustion capture because there is, a, you know, if you're going to accept the oxy combustion also is a post-combustion, but you've got concentrated CO2. And the CO2 capture technology 
selection depends on the in the CO2 concentration, temperature, pressure, and other characteristics of the gas which we are handling. It. So just to get to the next level, so what are the various capture pathways? So there are a number of capture pathways which are being uh, uh, developed. So so I basically put uh, you know the the five main pathways. One is the absorption, and the absorption can be a physical absorption where the 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 CO2 is physically absorbed like in methanol or glycol based materials or in ionic liquids, or it could be chemical absorption, which is most prevalent in the industry where we use amines, uh, alkaline solutions, hydrate, you know, hybrid amines, ammonia, modified ionic liquids. Uh, then if you go into the adsorption where we physically absorb, where we adsorb CO2 on a solid surface, uh, this could be physical adsorption like geolites or activated carbons or metal organic frameworks, which you would hear in the next presentation, and or, or chemical adsorption and chemical absorption. Uh, either you use amine and amine enriched sorbent or metal oxide like sodium oxide or potassium oxide or their carbonates. Then in some cases we can use membranes. Uh, but membranes are challenging for the flue gas, uh, but there are opportunities, and I'll briefly touch upon that. Then there are biological pathways, uh, forestation, oceanic fertilization, mic microalgae, which I will not discuss, uh, but uh, they are being researched. And then there are options for uh, you know, condensing CO2 using cryogenic pathways, and there's some technology being developed. So, so here, you know, Professor La uh, Long, uh, my next presenter, will talk about uh, most of the adsorption by solids. And I'll basically spend some time on the chemical adsorption, which is probably the most uh, advanced technology for CO2 capture. So just to show you, give you a flavor of uh, what type of uh, uh, flue gas we get uh, with various CO2 concentrations. So I basically put the major sources of the CO2 here. So if you take a coal, power, coal powered power plant, power plant where most of the work has been done, CO2 is 11 to 14% with very low partial pressure. Natural gas power plant, even uh, it is uh, even lower than uh, coal, fire, coal power plant, it's less between four and 6%. So that as the CO2 concentration goes down, the difficulty of separating it becomes uh, uh, more uh, harder. Uh, in the air, as we all know, the CO2 is only 400 ppm. So this is really a very difficult separation. But if you take some of the chemical uh, side, uh, if you take a natural gas processing plant where you remove CO2 from natural gas, uh, the CO2 could be 99% right from the, from the processing plant without any additional capture. Similar, same is the case for ammonia or ethanol plants. And one of the a very interesting uh, uh, cases, cement plant where CO2 could be 20%. And, uh, and uh, I think a lot of cement plants are really taking advantage of this high CO2 concentration. So, so, you know, so the, one of the things which, uh, uh, you know, it is not very well appreciated that you cannot just take one process and adapt that process for all CO2 streams. So, so the capture is basically a, you know, combination of materials which go into the into the process and the specific process designs, because you 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 just cannot have uh, one material which will work on all processes or all pro one specific process will work with all the other applications. So so, and I'll give you some specific examples uh, of various, uh, you know, some of these uh, some of these things which are in the slides. Uh, because if you're going to use a solvent for a for a for a for a natural gas combined cycle plant, flue gas that solvent probably needs to be run very differently for a coal-fired plant versus a cement, fire, cement uh, flue gas. So, so I just wanted to make sure that you appreciate this, uh, this uh, distinction, you know. So, so one of the major industrial uh, workhorse for CO2 capture is the solvent-based uh, post-combustion CO2 capture technology, where we use the an amine, uh, you know, most of the, the work is based on monoethylene amine which has been around in chemical industry for last 50, 60 years. And you know, the process is quite established. So basically you take the flue gas, go through a, a, a direct contact cooler where you cool the gas, flue gas down. Then uh, basically you have a tall column uh, filled up with packings where you, you basically contact the, the pump, the uh, pump, the amine and uh, amine solution and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and flue gas, they, they basically move up counter uh, uh, co-current wise uh, in some some designs you have a cooling water because the reaction is uh, uh, is exothermic so you need to control the the temperature and then the clean gas is vented 
and then the 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 sore bed which is laden by CO two is sent to a regenerator where you regenerate it, and then a regenerated solvent uh, is sent back to the absorber, and cycle completes. The regeneration is typically done with uh, with steam. So, so this is a basically a basic process which has been around very you know for a long time in the industry. So, typical solvents could be primary, secondary, tertiary, or hindered amine. Uh, you know, they they can produce CO two at very high purity. Uh, you know, the design of these systems are very well understood uh, in terms of uh, you know, CO two recovery, gas flow rate, etc. But the the there are some challenges with flue gas, which typically don't see we don't see them uh, with the other. Uh, uh, other uh, gas streams like natural gas processing plants. So there, there's been a lot of work in last 10, 15 years uh, funded by Department of Energy and also by industry where you know, we're looking at advanced solvents which have re lower regeneration energy requirement. I'll, I'll touch upon that. And, uh, and combined with high CO2 absorption capacity and tolerance to the gas impurity. So these could be water lean solvents, phase change solvents or high, high performance functionalized solvents. So, so if you look at the, the commercialization challenges for these materials is uh, one is the low overall absorption rate. If you can increase the absorption rate, we can reduce the column height and the capital cost. High regeneration energy is one of the most important challenge because this is basically directly relates to the total capture cost. Then loss of solvent due to degradation, uh, solvent loss due to emissions, uh, corrosion uh, and wastewater treatment. And some of the technology provider which supply the commercial technologies for this application are Mitsubishi, Shell, BASF, Acre Solutions, Floor, and you know, and there, there are other new technologies which are coming up uh, in the market. So, so in the, just to talk about a couple of problems, uh, you know, the the low overall absorption rate for amine-based solvents is a is an important part because the volume of flue gas is so high. For example, for a 500 megawatt coal plant. The volume of flue gas is 1.2 million actual cubic feet per minute. <laughs> so you could see the, the amount of gas we are handling. So we basically looking at the packing designs for better contacting, absorption column height, and some of the process intensification. One of the things we are doing uh, in our, our team is uh, developing some catalytic additives to enhance the absorption rate. So you know you can see example of a packing process intensification by using a rotating pack bed. So you can in, in, you intensify by a factor of ten. Uh, in this case, uh, the one second example is we basically are developing a catalytic additive which can be added, and by adding two thousand ppm of the catalytic additive, we increase the absorption rate by forty three percent. So uh, potentially this could really reduce the overall column height. And maybe call them diameter and reduce the overall capex. So I think these these innovations are being pursued, uh, you know. And then the second part, which is a high regeneration energy for amine-based solvents, with this varies between 2.1 to 3.8 gigajoules per ton of CO2, and this is the largest contributor of the the CO2 removal cost. So there are a number of uh, uh, innovations which are being happening. Uh, you know, people are redesigning the flow sheet. We're using advanced flash strippers, more heat recovery, ultrasound assisted regeneration to reduce this heat duty. We are basically looking at, uh, you know, the, you know, the catalytic additive. I just talked about it. We could speed up the, re the regeneration rate and reduce the, the temperature. And uh, you could see some of the initial data we got. We, the, we could reduce the, the overall heat duty by up to 30% in this case, you know. So, and then other adjunctions, I'm not going to read through that, but these are real challenges when we scale up the lab technology to commercial technologies. We need to worry about oxygen, which is there in the flue gas, uh, you know, what radical scavenger, sol solvent, entrainment, uh, volatility of the solvent, aerosols, which are generated. So all these things have to be really taken care of it uh, for a commercial process to work. And I think a lot of work is ongoing uh, in the in the industry and uh, and uh, academic community, so the, just to briefly touch upon the sorbent based CO two capture technologies. Uh, you'll hear that in the next presentation. But just to give you uh, various options, uh, you know, physical adsorption, uh, the work which is being done in alumina, geolites, activated carbons, MOPs, porous polymer networks, 
then uh, you know chemical absorption like mostly alkali alkali oxide materials uh, and also the amine encapsulated uh, uh, solvents there are the hybrid materials where you combine the best properties of amines and metal organic frameworks <clears throat> But there are commercialization challenges. You know, obviously, you know, one of the things is the CO2 concentration in flue gas. You know, the system for direct air capture will be very different than that will be for uh, coal flue gas, water in the flue gas. Then degradation with oxygen, flue gas contaminants, and long term stability. And then I think the one of the most important thing for the sorbent based technology is the reactor and process design, because you are we are handling large amount of flue gas and we need to figure out whether it's going to be fixed bed reactor or a fluidized bed reactor. You know, I think a lot of industrial players are moving to the structured bed material reactor, which I'll show you an example in a minute. Then the gas solid contacting becomes important and heat and mass transfer because absorption reaction is exothermic and endo and regeneration is endothermic, but, and we need to figure out how do we supply the heat and, uh, to the regeneration and how do we remove heat from the absorption. And then pressure drop because flue gas is at very low pressure. And the issues are like attrition, corrosion, disposal, and loss. I mean, leaching, these are typical losses. So one of the example I want to give you, commercial example is the technology which was developed by Swante. I think they're running this at 30 ton per day scale. This is a rotating uh, absorption machine, uh, you know, using a basically a you know, heat exchanger design uh, where it rotates slowly between absorption, regeneration, uh, and, and purging. And they got a 30 ton and now they're scaling it up to, 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 to 2000 uh, tons per day system. <clears throat> uh, also membrane based technologies are being developed for flue gas, but again, we need to realize the flue gas partial pressure is very low and, uh, and uh, sometimes CO2 concentration could be very low. So I think there are projects which are being uh, pursued for coal flue gas, coal based flue gas, as well as cement flue gas. And there are a number of membranes from polymer membranes to, uh, to, to facilitated transport membranes and non-facilitated where you, you facilitate the permeation of CO2. But again, <clears throat> you know, you, th these are good for CO2 concentration of uh, greater than 10% volume. Typically, the CO2 purity is low and will require significant downstream purification. And the CO2 nitrogen selectivity of membrane over 50 doesn't really buy much but the higher flux uh, could be very useful in terms of reducing the overall cost. So there are a couple, few things I wanted to just to give an example. So Department of Energy has funded some large demo projects uh, from the CCUS. One is the air products facility in uh, Port Arthur, which began in 2013. It is uh, connected with a steam methane reformer, CO2 capture. Another one is uh, Archer Daniel Midland in, uh, in Decatur, Illinois, uh, which is an ethanol facility. Uh, which started in uh, 2017. Then the Petronova plant uh, in Texas, uh, unfortunately this plant is now closed, but uh, this, he, it, this plant ran quite well. And then the, the, the shell console pro, 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 uh, technology at Boundary Dam in Sox Power in Canada. So there are examples of uh, CO2 capture from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from industrial streams and flue gases. So just briefly touch upon the direct air capture. Uh, uh, you know, just I'm just going to get one or two slides. Direct air capture, I, I just said there are challenges because uh, CO2 is only 400 ppm uh, in the in air. So we have nitrogen and oxygen is 2,500 times as of CO2 and water is 100 times. And the second is to one ton of CO2 removals require, requires us to handle 3,200 tons of air at 50% removal. So this is not a trivial amount of uh, flow which we need to handle. So if somebody has to design a million tons of CO2 plant from direct air capture. One can imagine how big that system will be and what type of energy and, uh, and uh, hardware we will need to deal with that. So this is something, um, uh, think about it. Uh, then, the, then the minimum energy for removal is 22 kilojoules per mole. And then we need some multiples of that to put that energy to separate that out. The kinetics has to be fast. Uh, the solvent uh, needs a fairly high capacity. It has to be dirt cheap, and uh, it needs to survive for long time. We can't afford to change this uh, material. So I think uh, the 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 key thing to this one is the is the you know it's not only the solvent. You know we need to understand process engineering and economics. They all need to go hand in hand to really really develop this technology. And a lot of work is being done and uh, on in this area. 
So, so current technology state, there are three companies, which are- uh, We'll need to, uh, to wrap this up pretty quickly, if you don't one, mind. One minute, yeah, one, 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 one more minute. So, Thank so you. Car carbon engineering, climb works and global thermostat. These are the three pioneers uh, in the direct uh, air capture area. There are other companies. We are also do, do started some work at early stage. We are at early stage. We are doing that, uh, but I think this, this solution is definitely needed to get to the net zero. And, uh, and, the, you know, and the last thing is the CO2 utilization. If you want to do something with CO2, we will need some energy which is carbon free because CO2 is the most oxidized form of the, uh, form of the carbon. So I was in, a, in National Academies Committee a couple of years back where we looked at the, the CO, how do we valorize the CO2 and there is an NAS report and this is a reference uh, in the presentation, if you are interested, so we looked at various pathways and what are the challenges from removing the CO, the, utilizing the CO2 because it's a very stable molecule. You know, so this basically uh, identify all the research needs uh, for CO2 removal, your CO2 utilization. <clears throat> so, so in summary, uh, I think we have uh, you know 51 uh, gigaton per year global uh, greenhouse emissions. CO2 is about 40, and we need to do something about it to get to the net zero target. I think the chemical energy industry sectors account for more than 50% of the CO2 emissions. So I think, you know, we all know about it. I think the solvent-based capture technology is the most advanced and they can be effectively used for point sources. You know, skill, there are scale up and uh, degradation challenges which are being addressed. Uh, regeneration energy is the largest component of CO2. And I think there's a lot of R&D which is being done there to reduce this number. Uh, the direct air capture or DAC has to be part of portfolio solutions to achieve uh, net zero emissions. And CO2 utilization uh, offers some interesting options to make products, but the scale to match CO2 emissions with the utilization options is going to be a challenge. So, so I don't want, I want to leave you that we can take on this challenge. This is a plant uh, which uh, Dave uh, and I, we work together uh, when I was at RTI. We, we designed, built, and uh, operated this 50 megawatt uh, CO2 capture plant at Tampa Electric. It's, uh, we captured 1,000 tons of CO2 in this uh, plant. So this is all doable. Uh, we, the problem is solvable, but we need, uh, we only need, a, we need an interdisciplinary approach and best minds engaged. And I think we can achieve this goal. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I took a few minutes more, longer than, than I expected. Dr. Gupta, thank you very much for that talk. You certainly covered a, uh, a lot of ground. I think we'll, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long, uh, who will speak about absorbent technologies. Uh, Dr. Long is a professor of chemistry and professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. He's also the director of Berkeley Center for Gas Separations and his research group focuses on the design and controlled synthesis of novel inorganic materials and molecules towards the fundamental understanding of new physical phenomena. So with that, uh, Professor Long. Thanks, hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna switch a little bit and, and talk about uh, some fundamental science uh, geared towards discovery of new CO2 capture materials. And my focus will be on uh, really a, a material that behaves in a, a completely different way from other porous solid CO2 adsorbents. Um, and it involves a, a cooperative mechanism for CO2 adsorption. And this allows for a switch-like behavior to the material uh, where you can go from fully loading CO2 to fully unloading the CO2 with a small temperature or pressure change. And the materials that we work on are, um, here we go, are metal organic frameworks. And uh, these are to us sort of designer zeolites uh, where you can use the power of synthetic chemistry to adjust uh, the pore size, uh, the pore geometry, the pore shape, or the pore um, dimensions, and also the surface functionality of the material. And it's that chemical tunability combined with record high surface areas that make MOFs powerful for uh, separation such as CO2 capture. And for uh, using a porous solid material like this, um, the way that uh, you would implement this in a, a CO2 capture process, the simplest way would be you could just fill a column uh, with the material and bring the flue gas in one side. And if you've done your job as a chemist uh, right, then only CO2 will stick 
to this very high internal surface area of the material. <clears throat> and the other gas molecules will come out uh, in, in purified form. And as you run the gas through the bed, eventually you'll, you'll fill up the moth and you'll then need to desorb CO2 in a pure form. Uh, and to do that, you'll either raise the temperature or drop the pressure of the bed. And once you release CO2, then you'll start again and capture more. So uh, most all of the materials that you would put into this kind of device um, show a Langmuir type adsorption behavior. And this means that uh, if we look at equilibrium uptake of carbon dioxide, uh, then we have a very steep rise at low pressures and eventually you saturate the surface of the material. And what this means is that once you've loaded CO2 onto the material, you either have to go to a very deep vacuum to pull all the CO2 off uh, or to very high, go to very high temperatures um, to uh, desorb much of the CO2. And so this leads to a lot of uh, costs and energy use in uh, doing an adsorption desorption capture process. And if you think about how these, the shape of these adsorption isotherms, um, they're really not ideal for having a, an efficient separation. What you'd really like to be able to do is something akin to how hemoglobin works. So you're all probably familiar with hemoglobin. It's this amazing biomolecule, uh, which has four different iron heme units. And those iron hemes can selectively bind an oxygen molecule. And when you bind oxygen at one of the hemes, there's a rearrangement in the protein backbone that opens up access to the other three hemes. And so hemoglobin actually binds and releases four oxygen molecules simultaneously. And that cooperative adsorption process leads to a step-shaped adsorption isotherm instead of that Langmuir shape that we saw before. And so this allows hemoglobin to bind and release these oxygen molecules uh, with quite a narrow change in the concentration or pressure of oxygen. And that's exactly the kind of thing we'd like to do uh, for having an efficient separation. And nobody realized that this was possible uh, in a dense way in a porous solid material until we accidentally discovered uh, that it's possible for carbon dioxide in an amine functionalized MOF. And just to introduce the MOF uh, that's the starting point for this story, um, it's based on MOF 74, which has a honeycomb-like structure. And here you're looking at a view going down one of the channels within the honeycomb. And in MOF 74, these channels are about 12 angstroms across. And what I wanna point out are running along the, at the corners of each hexagonal channel, you have these rows of green atoms, and these are coordinatively unsaturated metal centers. And they're spaced about six and a half angstroms apart as you go along the channel direction. And so there are six such chains, one at each corner of a hexagonal channel. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach a diamine to each of those metal sites. And uh, so you're gonna have rows of metals with diamines at attached. Um, and it turns out that that uh, creates a material that shows cooperative CO2 adsorption. And the way it works is CO2 is actually inserting into the metal amine bonds. And when you do that insertion, uh, you transfer a proton from the backside of this nitrogen on, on the bound amine to a dangling amine to form an ammonium cation that's attracted to the carbamate. And you can think of that as activating this next metal amine bond for CO2 insertion. And so CO2 is being zipped up into ammonium carbamate chains. Uh, and there's one of those chains running along each corner of a hexagonal channel within the material. So what you're seeing here is a cross cut of one of those channels. There's uh, ample room for diffusion of CO2 in and out. 
Um, and like hemoglobin, this material, uh, it simultaneously binds and then releases carbon dioxide at a very specific temperature and pressure. And so that kind of behavior is reflected in these step-like adsorption isotherms. Uh, and so what you, what you see here is that at a specific um, pressure and temperature, you can all of a sudden have this vertical rise and CO2 is taken up in a, a cooperative process. And this works because uh, we've got just the right diamine chain length to form these ammonium carbamate chains. And the point of this is that with those steps, uh, you can then um, have a very large separation capacity with a small temperature or pressure change. And so if we compare uh, sort of classical amine solutes like an MEA, MEA solution in water uh, or amine adsorbents, um, then these Langmuir isotherms mean that uh, when you load the materials with CO2 and then go to regenerate and desorb CO2, you actually leave most of the carbon dioxide in the solution or in the solid. You're, even if you're doing say a hundred degree increase in temperature, uh, a lot of CO2 is gonna remain uh, undesorbed. Uh, in contrast for these step shaped uh, isotherm materials, um, if we position the step in the right place, um, then a very small temperature or pressure change can give us the entire capacity of the material, uh, say 15 weight percent CO2, as opposed to two or three weight percent CO2. And so this small delta T uh, can be a big advantage um, in terms of the energy associated with the CO2 capture process. Um, so knowing the mechanism of how this material adsorbs carbon dioxide allows us to adjust the adsorption step position and try to optimize the material for a specific CO2 capture application. And the sort of handles we have are, um, since we're inserting this metal amine bond, if we change uh, the nature of the amine bound to the metal, we change the thermodynamics of the reaction with CO2, and that will move the adsorption step position. If we change this spacer between nitrogens, that changes the structure of the ammonium carbamate chains being formed, and again, changes the thermodynamics. And then finally, changing the substituents on the ammonium forming nitrogen uh, will change the energy of this chain forming ammonium carbamate interaction. So these are all handles or knobs that we can do, tune uh, in adjusting uh, CO2 uptake properties of the material. Um, and so this is just an example showing uh, if we attach these four different diamines to this inexpensive magnesium-based moth, um, then as we bear, build up steric encumbrance at the ammonium-forming nitrogen, uh, we can push that step uh, out in pressure at a given temperature. So we've tested many, many different uh, diamines within this material. Um, more than 80 now. And by changing that diamine, we can adjust the adsorption step uh, at 40 degrees, anywhere from two parts per million, where you're very effectively capturing CO2 from air, uh, to out past two bar, which may have uh, uses for high pressure CO2 removal. So with this kind of tunability, um, uh, you can target a specific application. And essentially what we're doing here is we're changing the thermodynamics uh, for the material binding CO2. And you can see uh, the delta H for CO2 adsorption here, we can adjust uh, anywhere from minus 40 kilojoules per mole to out past minus 100 kilojoules per mole. And as you go to these uh, stronger and stronger Enthalpically, uh, enthalpic contributions to the driving force, um, you're generally making more and more tightly wrapped chains. And so you can see you pay a larger and larger entropic penalty. So as we change the diamine within this MOF, we move along this line, uh, but the ability to move along this line allows us to target a specific CO2 capture application and make it as efficient as possible. 
And so a uh, previous speaker already mentioned uh, a lot of the different uh, capture needs. Uh, some of those are listed here. And the point is uh, the CO2 concentration in those various streams can be uh, widely varying from very low pressure, such as in air, um, to uh, significantly higher pressures, such as in natural gas sweetening or in hydrogen, producing uh, hydrogen for fertilizer. So a lot of research focus has really been on coal flue gas capture, um, but optimizing materials for all of these other places we need to decarbonize is, is an extremely important uh, research direction. Um, and so these materials are being developed uh, commercially by a company uh, called Mosaic Materials. This company was started by Tom McDonald in the center here, who was the PhD student that originally discovered uh, the cooperative CO2 adsorbents. Uh, and the kind of thing they do is uh, produce these materials at low cost in large quantities and also in structured forms um, that are mechanically robust and won't show attrition uh, during a separation process. And so I'm gonna finish just by uh, giving you a, a, a small uh, additional story um, about the tunability here and how we can adjust chemistry within these materials to try and address uh, process uh, issues that come up when you really start to integrate an adsorbent in a separation. Uh, and so perhaps eight years ago, we were approached by ExxonMobil. Uh, they were interested in the stepped uh, adsorbents uh, for natural gas, flue gas capture, and they wanted their process to operate at very high temperatures, capturing and releasing at very high temperatures, and that can minimize water coadsorption. Um, and so if you, if you need to go to very high temperatures for these materials, one issue that, that can come up uh, is above 130, 140 degrees C, you start to uh, possibly volatilize the diamines. And the solution that we came up with was from studying crystal structures. We realized in this crystal structure that uh, the ethyl groups are leaning over towards each other on neighboring sites uh, around the periphery of the channel. Uh, and we thought um, perhaps we can just make a covalent connection there and still maintain that cooperative chain forming mechanism for CO2 adsorption. Uh, and so we started testing uh, tetramines. So one of those is shown here. And amazingly, these tetramines, in fact, organize within the material. You can see now we've got two attachment points as well as hydrogen bonds between neighboring tetramines. Uh, and these become now very robust to extreme conditions for CO2 capture and release. And so this is just showing a thousand adsorption desorption cycles uh, for a low concentration. This would be a natural gas type flue gas. Um, and we're capturing at hundred degrees C uh, and then releasing, you can heat up to 180 and you see there's no loss of capacity as you cycle these materials. And seeing that we thought perhaps we could even do uh, steam stripping for regeneration. For capture in a place where you have uh, access to steam, particularly low-grade steam that's not being efficiently used for electricity generation, uh, this can be a very uh, low-cost option for regenerating your material. And I won't have time to go into details, but these are IR spectra just showing that we can actually do isothermal uh, cycling where we're switching from 120 degree C stream containing CO2. Uh, we have CO2 adsorption to form those uh, ammonium carbamate chains. And then we can switch to just a pure steam stream at the same temperature and remove the CO2. And that can be cycled. And so just to give you an idea of what's going on here, here's a, a, a GIF that one of my students made so here we're going to focus on one of the channels in the MOF. You can see how the tetramines are binding. We'll rotate 90 degrees. Here's a top view. And when CO2 adsorbs, there are actually two different types of chains that form, one at each end at slightly different energetics. So these materials actually show a double step instead of a single step. 
Once you're loaded with CO2, you can bring in steam, desorb the CO2, and start again. And so finally, I just want to um, mention that there are a lot of needs um, for developing uh, new approaches to CO2 capture. The amount of energy that's going to be needed for uh, regenerating a lot of uh, materials used in these processes is tremendous. And uh, as the previous speaker pointed out, it's, it's particularly costly for separating CO2 from air. And so this is a, this is a necessary research challenge, um, but we don't actually have good solutions yet for materials that can effectively uh, do this with, with low energy penalty. Um, and so I think uh, I'd like to encourage people to take up that research challenge. And fundamentally, it is a materials uh, synthesis challenge. So I'll, I'll just wrap up there and thank some really brilliant students, postdocs, and collaborators, uh, some sources of funding, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Long. Uh, one question that came from the participants was around the uh, robustness of these materials, and you, you mentioned that these were quite robust uh, in uh, kind of at least simulating industrial processes. Uh, how well do these stand up relative to uh, absorbance, uh, solid absorbance that are commonly used in carbon capture? Um, yeah, so the degradation mechanisms for amine solutions and, and solids, uh, that's always a, an issue that you need to address. And the current materials being used uh, do degrade fairly quickly. Um, and so, the way we're tying down the amines in these solids uh, can actually lead to longer lifetimes where the decomposition pathways accessible in solution are not necessarily accessible in these materials. Also, if you operate at lower temperature conditions, you have less degradation. And so one of the advantages for these materials can be uh, less degradation as you cycle. Very good. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our, uh, our final speaker, Dr. Ana Alba Rubio, who will talk about dual function materials. Dr. Alba Rubio is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Toledo. Her current research interests involve the rational design and synthesis of nanomaterials for catalysis and sensing applications with a special interest in producing fuels and materials sustainably and developing technologies to improve the human condition. With that, uh, Professor Alba Rubio. Hi, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, so um, as it was said, I'm gonna be talking about dual function materials that can capture and convert CO2. So um, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Long has been talking about CO2 capture, and I would be talking about some materials that in addition to capture can also convert CO2. So let me see if I had the control here. Yeah, so a brief introduction of, of my group has been already mentioned, but uh, what we do is synthesizing materials, uh, well-defined materials for catalysis and sensing applications. And we are especially focused in, in multifunctional catalysts that are catalysts that can do different things uh, during the course of the reaction. Um, one of the examples of the research that we do in our lab um, is the development of dual function materials for CO2 capture and conversion. Um, so here we represented this in our uh, recent uh, review paper. Uh, this type of materials, dual function materials, DFM for sure, as materials that can capture CO2 and then convert into value added products. So the same material can do both things. And in this case, uh, CO2 is being hydrogenated to methane and water. And this is one of the reactions that has been mostly used for dual function materials. And this methane is not expected to be released to the atmosphere if not being used as a fuel so a source for the, for the industry. Um, so we are developing materials to, to, in our case, in our lab, we are developing these type of materials to produce higher value added products such as methanol and higher alcohols as part of the uh, career award that uh, I got from NSF uh, two years ago. So it has been already mentioned the carbon capture and sequestration as a good way to, to take the CO2 from the environment or from flue gas um, to store in geological formations. 
but we are more excited about capturing CO2 and utilizing that to produce um, other value added products. And as part of that, um, we are developing these dual function materials that I just mentioned, which has some advantages such as that both uh, sorbent um, and conversion components are together in the same material. Also, they both can operate isothermally, so both the capture and the conversion can happen at the same temperature. So it's not needed those uh, thermal swings, uh, regeneration um, that occur in other capture processes. Also, they can uh, treat uh, diluted uh, CO2 streams. And very importantly, uh, this could help to eliminate transportation and storage of CO2 because these materials can be used in situ to convert CO2 into value added products such as fuels that can be uh, used back in the, in the plant, right, for, for energy. So uh, here I would like to show these uh, dual function materials process flow diagram proposed by Professor Farauto's group. Um, actually, my, my research is very inspired by, by the research that uh, he as his group has been doing. So I'm going to be showing many, many of his papers today. Um, so here, uh, this uh, flow diagram, what we have is a power plant in which we have the flue gas. Uh, some of those uh, pollutants are going to be removed before reaching the dual function material. So this dual function material is going to be saturated by CO2 um, by using hydrogen that ideally could come from um, renewable sources, such as, for example, the electrolysis of water with um, renewable energy. This hydrogen can be flow uh, through the dual function material to um, hydrogen, uh, do the hydrogenation of CO2 into methane and also regenerate the material for future capture. And that methane can be recycled and used as a fuel in the power plant. This uh, production of methane from, from CO2 is um, uh, for the use of dual function materials is especially interesting because it's a isothermic reaction. So the, the heat that is going to be released here can help the CO2 desorption and the spillover of CO2 from, from the sorbent to the catalytic sites. So here um, there is um, an example of a dual function material which we have the support gamma alumina then the sorbent, in this case, is uh, calcium oxide, and the catalyst, that is uh, ruthenium nanoparticles. So in this case, the flue gas, uh, the CO2, is going to be absorbed onto the calcium oxide. This is going to be a spillover to the ruthenium nanoparticle. And with hydrogen, it's going to be hydrogenated to form methane and water. And actually, this isothermic reaction is going to promote the desorption of this CO2 to continue the, the reaction, the further capture and conversion. Uh, so as I said, these dual function materials has two components, the absorbent and the uh, catalyst that is going to convert CO2. Um, the most used uh, absorbents in, in these dual function materials are usually metal oxides and metal carbonates, which are um, good because they are inexpensive and highly reactive. However, both um, has the problem that uh, after a while, because uh, it needs to be regenerated at high temperature, they can sinter and lose the capacity to absorb CO2. So the way that um, this is um, uh, uh, studied in the literature, how to improve this, is by um, dispersing this metal oxide and metal carbonate on the surface as a support. So the particles, the, the material is very well dispersed, so it cannot easily uh, sinter. So they can be stable for longer. That would be the absorbent co component of the dual function material. Um, and now I'm going to be talking about the catalyst component. So once the CO2 is absorbed, the different metals that can be used to convert that CO2. So in this case, uh, one of the uh, metals mostly used for dual function materials is nickel. So nickel is a very inexpensive material that can be used for, for these reactions. Um, and also it's very versatile. So we can um, do different reactions by using nickel. So in this case, there is a table with different dual function materials that use nickel. So nickel with calcium oxide or nickel with uh, calcium and sodium as the promoter or nickel sodium carbonate. So most of them has been synthesized by um, typical synthesis method of catalyst. 
And these nickel dual function materials catalysts have been used for the uh, dry reforming of methane, the reverse water gas shift, the dry um, reforming of ethane, or methanation. But as I said before, methanation is especially interesting for the study of these materials because it's isothermic and can contribute to the distortion of CO2. And as you can see here, one of the advantages is that both the absorption and the reaction can take at the same uh, temperature. So first we have CO2, CO2 diluted is being absorbed on the material and saturated. And then there is uh, the reaction by flowing hydrogen or another compound that is going to be reacting with the CO2. So both the absorption and the reaction can occur at the same temperature. Uh, however, these temperatures are kind of high. And this is due to the fact that nickel um, uh, need high temperatures to, to be reduced. So um, the, here in this um, uh, paper, they show that uh, when using flue gas, uh, clean flue gas, using a nickel sodium oxide uh, lumina catalyst, the activity and the production of methane was very high. But when flowing a flue gas that contains some air um, and steam, the activity uh, dropped dramatically. And they found that this is because nickel is um, becomes oxidized and, and is not easily reduced because of the high temperature uh, required to reduce nickel. So what um, was proposed is uh, uh, doing alloys of nickel with other noble metals such as platinum, palladium, or ruthenium in uh, this other paper. Um, by only adding 1% of the noble metal, they were able to reduce the uh, reduction temperature to around 320 degrees C which is uh, much, much more convenient, and only by using 1% of the noble metal. Um, making the catalyst more stable, um, um, being able to use that at lower temperatures. But uh, in addition to the alloys of nickel with noble metals, noble metals have also been used to, for the development of dual function materials such as ruthenium and rhodium. So here there is a, a table that has different ruthenium and rhodium catalyst with the sorbent component. Again, most of them synthesized by conventional method and for methanation. And as you can see here, by using noble metals, we can do this absorption and reaction at much lower temperature, which is uh, very convenient from the uh, uh, power point of view. And this is also different um, dilutions of CO2 and then uh, flowing hydrogen for the conversion. Um, continuing with the uh, ruthenium and rhodium. So you might be wondering uh, if we need a sorbent and a catalytic component, is, it is better to add first the sorbent and then the catalyst or the, or the opposite. So in this study, they found that it's, it's better to put the sorbent first, impregnate the support first with the, with the sorbent and then the catalyst because in that way ruthenium can be more dispersed on the surface without being uh, encapsulated by by the sorbent. Um, additionally, they found that even with physical mixtures of catalyst and sorbent, there is um, an increased activity in the methanation. And this is due to the fact that even when the sorbent and the uh, catalyst are separated, still there is this spillover of CO2 from the sorbent to the catalyst, improving the, the hydrogenation. And they showed that this catalyst with ruthenium, calcium oxide, and gamma alumina was stable for, for many cycles. And this was with a clean flue gas, um, a simulated flue gas. But when working under more realistic conditions, such in, in this case, with the steam and oxygen, um, what they found is like ruthenium, um, when we have CO2 and oxygen becomes oxidized, ruthenium oxide. And even when we flow hydrogen to do the CO2 methanation, the rate at which the catalyst is reduced is not as fast as it should be. So somewhat it decreased the, the absorption capacity as well as the methanation rate. And they also studied um, how to uh, how the, the absorptive capacity of the, of the species in, affect the effectiveness of the dual function materials. Showing here that if the capture component, the sorbent is able to capture more CO2, also the methanation rates is, are gonna be increasing. 
Um, uh, in this study, uh, it was um, compared rhodium with ruthenium. And in, as we can see here with 5% of ruthenium and only 0.1% of, of rhodium, the production of uh, methane with these dual functional materials is very similar. However, we need to take into account that the current price of uh, rhodium is much, much higher than ruthenium. So it seems like these rhodium materials, even when able to produce methane from CO2, um, is not the, the most convenient one. And in the literature, it has, um, uh, there has been also some examples of non noble metals. So all of them are not rhodium, uh, ruthenium metals like that. And also metals that even when they are non noble metals, they can work at uh, lower temperatures, so not as high as nickel. So in this example, um, these authors uh, uh, supported iron, copper, and chromium onto a um, um, hydrothal site modified with um, uh, potassium. So they found that by uh, during the CO2 capture, this uh, CO2 forms carbonate on the potassium. And then when switched to hydrogen, that is this uh, chain in here, um, that's going to be reacting with the CO2 to form CO. So this is uh, to produce in gas and some CO2 that uh, was not converted. And even when this uh, material uh, used non-noble metals, they found that the material was stable under um, ideal flu, flu gas and also under more realistic conditions uh, involving oxygen and water. Another sample in the literature has used copper, which is um, something that we are very interested in our lab. So in this case, they use um, copper alumina and they promoted that with potassium and barium. And they found that when uh, promoting with potassium, um, as we can see here, we can capture CO2. And then once that we switch to um, hydrogen for the hydrogenation, we produce CO. Also some uh, very small amount of methane. Um, and very interestingly, they found that uh, by surface studies that copper remain uh, reduced, not oxidized. Um, and also they found uh, formate species, which are um, especially interesting for us because uh, formate species are found when obtaining CO or, or when producing methanol. And in our lab, we are interested in producing these dual functional materials to obtain methanol. Um, so we believe that copper could be a, a good metal for, for dual functional materials. Um, finally, I would, I would like to talk really quick about this uh, very recent study um, that they use um, dual functional materials to, to, to convert um, CO2 directly from air. So in this case, 415 ppm of CO2 in air were used with this um, material that I mentioned before, containing ruthenium and, and sodium oxide. And they found very good CO2 capture um, methanation rates. And very interestingly, because of the um, dilute uh, system and the, the different flows that they used, they found that it was enough for the, to maintain the ruthenium reduced during the reaction due to the hydrogenation of the CO2, that hydrogen in the environment was enough to maintain uh, ruthenium reduced. So the catalyst was stable also for, for many cycles. And additionally, they, they show that by adding, uh, when they have a moisture, some moisture in the flue gas, the activity drops, but this is um, irreversible. So it's, uh, it can be, uh, sorry, it's reversible. So it can be returned to the previous activity just by removing that moisture. So um, we are a little uh, on time already. So let me just summarize this. Um, what is my, my vision of the future of dual function materials? So I believe, um, uh, most of the studies has been done um, to synthesize dual function materials by using convention, conventional techniques to synthesize catalysts such as impregnation. I believe that uh, trying to control the proximity between the sorbent and the catalyst can, can help to produce um, dual function materials more efficient. And um, also these uh, copper uh, nanoparticles if we are able to control the oxidation uh, during the reaction and everything, uh, that could help to produce other value added products in addition to methane, such as methanol, high alcohol. So our idea is uh, producing methanol so it can be used in a, a direct fuel cell to, to power the plant. 
So that could be um, also something very interesting. And I also got very excited about seeing this study in which dual function materials can be used directly to take um, CO2 from air. So with that, I would like to thank you all for, for coming to the organization, for inviting me to, to give this talk. And also I would like to thank my, my current group. Well, this is uh, before pandemic. So there are some new students and some of them has already graduated. Also former students and collaborators in this project. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Alba Rubio. Uh, there's been a number of questions uh, that, have, that have come in, but I'd like to just focus on one for now, if I could. And that is the, the utility of this sort of a catalyst system for producing other chemicals other than methane and, and, and how selective these catalysts are for the desired end product. Yes, yeah, so um, I think we can, um, actually we, we have shown that we can produce methanol with these type of materials. Um, so I, I believe that there is, it's just, uh, this is in, in infancy, right? So there is a still a way to modify the catalyst properly. So what we are doing right now is uh, uh, doing this inverse catalyst in which we put um, as I showed at the beginning, this uh, Lego structure, right? That we put one piece on top of another. So in a way that we can produce this interfacial size to promote the production of other, uh, other products other than, than methane. So, but this is a little more challenging than the typical catalyst that we synthesize because we also have the solvent component that is also affecting the uh, oxidation state and everything. So, Definitely, there is there is a way to produce these um, higher uh, higher value added products, but uh, yeah, it needs uh, more development. Great. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we could now move into the uh, the, the panel discussion part of the uh, of the webinar. Um, if I could ask the, the speakers to all get on turn on your video, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit questions uh, through the Q and A button on Zoom, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And if they actually don't see the icons, just hover the mouse over there, and they and they should appear. Uh, you can also email questions to csr at nas.edu, and uh, I'll I'll get the pleasure of actually posing the questions to the uh, this distinguished panel. Um, first question, and maybe I'll direct it uh, since you spoke last, uh, 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 Professor Alba Rubio is the, your thoughts on the, the challenges of scaling up these, these intricate technologies to solve this very pressing problem. And in particular, the, the, the problems you think that will arise when you begin to confront these materials with real live flue gas versus uh, kind of lab grade flue gas that, uh, that is you know, the source of most experimentation. If you could start Dr. Alba Rubio we, and we can move through the panel with that question. Yes. Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a nice question. So as we know, the flue gas is, is not just CO2, right? It's, uh, there are more components in there. And the most uh, uh, problematic might be uh, sulfur oxides and uh, nitrogen oxides. So especially there has been, um, in the literature has been shown, uh, some people have been using uh, this simulated flue gas with SO2 and show that this SO2 reacts with uh, potassium carbonate to form potassium sulfite. And, and this is actually eliminating the capture uh, capacity of the material. So definitely this uh, more complex or, or real actually, a real flue gas is, is gonna be something that needs to be um, systematic, systematically studied with this type of materials because they can affect the, the catalyst but also the solving component. So yeah, this is something that, um, that uh, in our studies we have in mind and it's something that um, makes things a little more complicated, but uh, can, be, can be overcome. Uh, Professor Long, I mean, could you speak to the same question with respect to your materials? Sure, yeah. Um, so it, it does depend a lot on the source of CO2 and you know, coal flue gas is one of the dirtier um, inlets. Uh, that we would have and SOX and NOx can be a problem. Um, so we have studied uh, a couple of materials uh, for SOX and NOx degradation or, or you know, effects. And um, what those studies show, you know, we've, we've particularly used SO2 combined with water in the incoming stream. Um, and that uh, SO2 is uh, absorbed onto the amines in the MOF 
Um, and, you know, with the first uh, couple of cycles, you lose something like 30% capacity for CO2 uptake uh, that you can't re recover. Um, but then cycling after that, we seem to maintain uh, about 70% of the capacity. And so we don't quite know exact, you know, why um, we're retaining some of that capacity. Um, but if you, if you have a large dose of SO of SOX that gets over into your uh, material, what you can do is um, you can actually recover by washing out the amines uh, in the MOF and replacing them. Um, so you can fully recover if you have an accident with your, your D SOX unit, for example, and get a large dose of, of SOX onto the adsorbent. You don't have to uh, throw away the, the MOF and, re and, and get a fresh batch of MOF. Isn't that, Dr. Gupta, you've done some work with uh, a scale up of some of these technologies. What would you say are the major issues uh, any technology is likely to confront uh, in, in, um, in, in scale up? I think the scale up uh, here in the flue gas case is pretty daunting because of the sheer volumes which we are handling here in this case. You know, this is not a typical. Uh, you know, like if we look at the SOX, NOX removal, we were handling PPM levels of SOX and NOX uh, from the flue gas. But here in the CO2 case, we are, you know, some cases uh, 15, 20% CO2 with large volumes of the flue gas. So that means we need fairly large contractors, uh, you know, fairly large amount of uh, esteem and energy and, uh, and process optimization. So I think it's all doable. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, doing learning by doing things and i think some of the projects uh, which uh, which were installed and i gave the example in my presentation like for example the shell technology at boundary dam there there were challenges with amine and foaming the salts uh, uh, you know it be the real fuel gas and then they have to redesign parts of the system uh, there so so obviously you know, there'd be a much better understanding now than we had five years back in terms of all these uh, technology issues. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I'll say, yes, we should not ignore them as we design this, try to get as much information about flue gas, what is the contaminants we have, what are the properties of the solvent will be, and how do we design these systems to deal with those just because afterwards, the, the, the changes in the system are very expensive and painful, you know. Right. Yeah, a lot of the original R and D in this sector was driven by the uh, by the power sector and the needs of, uh, of either coal combustion or coal gasification and, and natural gas as well. Uh, I, I guess, what are your thoughts on how these technologies can be applied into the industrial sector, whether it's steel production, cement production, or other uh, industrial processes? And are there unique kind of technical challenges associated with that? Yeah, so let me start with that. So. So let's take the example of the cement industry. I think it's a perfect example. So all the learnings which we had for doing CO2 capture from coal flue gas, essentially all those learnings can be applied to the cement industry. Uh, fortunately, the cement flue gas contains about 20% CO2, which is higher than uh, in a coal, coal flue gas, which is about uh, 13, 14%. But it has some other contaminants, like for example, the SOX and NOx uh, are uh, much more severe in the cement flue gas. So that means we probably have to have a preconditioning unit uh, going into the cement flue gas. But essentially, all the technology components which were there for the coal flue gas can be directly uh, used for the cement flue gas. Uh, you know, also there is a possibility of integrating waste heat uh, in the cement plant, which we don't have in the coal plant, to reduce the the steam duty on the regenerator a little bit. You know. Hmm. Similarly, steel industry is true. The natural gas is a different, uh, a completely different uh, uh, system because we, if you go into the combined cycle, we have 4% CO2 and most of the technologies uh, which are designed for 14% CO2, they typically don't uh, work well for 4%. You need to rethink about the reactor design and the process design. And uh, so, so I think there are some challenges, but I think we are learning about it, how to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we should be able to, 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 to get there with some demonstration plants, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on that one? Okay. Uh, um, 
all, all three of you mentioned uh, air, direct air capture, but, but somewhat in passing is it was not really the, uh, the this, this central theme of the, uh, of the research. Is what are your thoughts on, uh, on the unique technical and scientific challenges related to making air capture uh, a reality on a large scale? Jeff, you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I can, I can try. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, dilute stream. So you're unmixing, uh, you know, 400 ppm of CO2 from that, from, from the, uh, you know, one bar air. And, uh, you know, that means there's this big um, minimum energy requirement. So right away, you're, you're going to have to spend quite a bit of energy doing this separation. Um, so we, you know, we don't want to, we want to get as close to that, of course, as we can. Um, a lot of the, probably the main um, energy requirement currently is in regenerating after capturing CO2 from air. So uh, normally uh, a company like Climeworks, uh, you're doing um, resistive heating uh, and thermally um, using temperature increase to release the CO2 as well as a vacuum. So it's both heat and vacuum uh, for getting the CO2 off these materials. Um, and the energy requirements there are very large. And, uh, and it's, it's uh, that regeneration energy we need to improve and lower. Also the time to heat up the materials and then cool, cool the materials back down. Um, that plays into how quickly you can do an adsorption desorption cycle. Um, and so uh, new ways of efficiently removing and adding heat into the adsorbent can be really important. Um, and then another issue is uh, capture rate. You know, if you're only taking, uh, say, 20, 30 percent of the CO2 out of air when it moves through your, your device, um, then you need to blow a lot more air. So materials that can have good kinetics and extract a high fraction of CO2 in the air um, are important. And then also capacity. The higher your capacity for taking CO2 out of air, uh, the less often you have to regenerate and put in that additional energy and time. So those are some of the factors that we should think about in developing new materials. I can, I can also add something. So I, as I had a small chart uh, in my deck slide, uh, I didn't have time to go through it, but. Uh, but as, uh, as Professor Long said, I think the solvent is critical in terms of the, the energy and the reactivity and uh, mass class. But I think the reactor design cannot be underestimated. First and foremost is the pressure drop because you can't afford to have a lot of pressure drop because uh, you, know, you have to compress that air to push the air through the reactor. And uh, that number, even if you have 0.1 PSI, it adds up very quickly into real kilowatt hours. The second one is the is the heat for the regeneration and the numbers uh, right now, which are being floated in industry, are somewhere around 2,000 to 3,000 kilowatt hour per ton of CO2. So if the electricity is five cents a kilowatt hour, that number adds 200 to 150 dollars a ton just for that region regeneration energy. And then you got auxiliary loads on the vacuum and uh, everything else, and then you got capital. So I think this is a this is a real challenging engineering problem, but I am very optimistic. I think with the innovations, as Professor Long said, how do we selectively heat the material? Don't waste the heat. How do we push things? How do we design through computational fluid dynamics? I think all these things are being done, and I'm very optimistic that we will be able to reach to a point where the cost could be quite reasonable for this uh, this system. Mm -hmm. Good. Which applications do you all feel are closest to uh, fruition and uh, actually being uh, implemented at, at scale? Okay, so I can go there. So, so I think uh, uh, in terms of the cement industry has been extremely aggressive uh, for really, really implementing CO2 capture. So there are a number of projects which are coming up. Uh, and uh, in fact, DOE is funding a number of uh, front-end engineering design studies for large cement plants. So I think the cement industry or another thing with every ton of cement we produce, we produce one ton of CO2. So it's a fairly large penalty on the cement industry. So they are very keen to see something going on. So that's number one, which is happening. Number two is the, the hydrogen production industry using steam methane reformers. 
I think that industry, with every kilogram of hydrogen you produce in an SMR, you may produce 10 kilograms of CO2 roughly, maybe 9.6, how you did. So that industry is getting very motivated to figure out, uh, put the CO2 capture units on that. I think then there's, there are projects on NGCC and natural gas combined cycle. I think there are projects in the steel industry, you know, ArcelorMittal just announced a study. So they want to capture CO2 from the, from the steel plant. So, so I think the industrial decarbonization is, take, is moving much faster than the power sector carbonization right now. Okay. Anyone else on that one? I can, I can say a little bit about you know, the, the types of materials that I was talking about. Um, those are much earlier stage than you know, solvent-based systems and um, things that are you know, going into cement uh, capture processes. Um, and the, the place that those are nearest to being used would be in, in much smaller scale applications initially, such as uh, scrubbing CO2 in the atmosphere of a submarine uh, or in a space vessel, um, you know, and then next maybe direct air capture. You know, these could be drop-in replacements into a system like Climeworks builds. Um, but those those are um, those can be relatively small devices that are modular, um, and uh, you know the number of cycles required at these low concentrations of uh, you know, streams that you're removing CO2 from uh, significantly less. Uh, and so those are advantages for some of these um, sort of newer materials. And also the way our materials operate, I think they have the biggest advantage at these dilute uh, conditions. Right. So what are the big scientific challenges moving forward? Uh, you know, what are the scientific problems that need to be addressed to be able to uh, be able to move to the next level with, uh, with, you know, with kind of engineering applications? Yeah. I, I, you solved I them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, is that, who, who would you like to respond yeah. there? Uh, <laughs> um, forward, Professor Long. <laughs> okay, all right, sorry. I don't want to dominate things here. Um, yeah. I, uh, I mean, uh, so I think addressing a, a very difficult uh, high work cost process like direct air capture, there's a lot of need for just how do we make a material that can, can give us the performance we, we want. Um, but the next step for, for a lot of, uh, at least you know, for us after you discover these materials that can have this special switch-like function the next steps are really working with um, developing processes and working with process engineers and different process designs to figure out how to, how to best utilize these very unusual materials. Um, and the good news is there's a lot of tunability. And so if you're working with um, a process that and you encounter a problem, sometimes we can solve that problem by you know, a tweak to the material. Uh, or a change in how we make the material. And so, uh, you know, getting materials chemists working with process uh, engineer and modelers, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there for, for um, having dramatic, uh, uh, low, dramatically lower costs associated with these separations. If I can add to that, uh, so I think if you look at the, the research and the technology development in this particular domain, I think there's a lot of work which has been done at between TRL1 to TRL4, and there are a lot of good ideas. But, uh, but I think we don't have that much emphasis going from TRL4 to TRL6 and TRL7. And I think a lot of technology really don't go that far because the universities don't have that kind of expertise. And industry was a little bit reluctant to invest a lot of money into those developments. But now I think the, that situation is now changing. So I think there is a critical need to really take some of these technologies to TRL four, five, six level and fail fast and really, really, you know, try to push like what SpaceX is doing is, you know, figure out the disruptive ideas, whether they work or not, move, move on to the next one. And I think there is a critical need for those type of engineering breakthrough, I will not say scientific breakthrough, but the engineering, how do we put these things together? Like for example, these 
unique mob structure with Professor Long is working. How do we put them in devices? How do we mass produce those devices? How do we really implement those devices? So I think that is really missing in the, in the currently in the system, you know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add that even when the direct air capture seems like very interesting, right? And it's exciting as well. I think we should uh, put our efforts right now in trying to avoid uh, releasing CO2, right? To the atmosphere more than taking whatever is in there, right? Because it, it takes uh, more energy, right, to do that. So if we can um, have an implementation and, and make sure that these carbon cycles are closed, right, and we don't release that CO2 to the atmosphere, I think um, we should invest more um, energy in trying to, to keep this, um, uh, the, the carbon cycle uh, closed, right, more than, than taking the CO2 from, from the air. Good. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll let that be the, the, uh, the last word uh, in this, uh, this webinar. I'd like to thank uh, all three of our speakers, uh, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Albarubio, Professor Long, and, uh, and, and Dr. Gupta. Uh, all three presentations and the recording of the webinar will be posted to the CSR website uh, by the end of the week. Uh, the URL, I believe, is on your screen. If anyone has additional questions, comments, or concerns, uh, please uh, email those to, uh, to CSR at nas.edu. Our next uh, webinar, if you enjoyed this one, will be held on September 9th, uh, 2021. We'll discuss sustainable chemical manufacturing. Also note the CSR will host a one and a half day workshop on diversity, equity, and inclusion in chemistry and chemical engineering on May 25th and 26th of this year. Uh, there's more information about these events and others, um, and you can subscribe for updates uh, on the CSR website. Thanks uh, for all of you participating. Thanks, of course, particularly to our, our, our three speakers, and I uh, look forward to seeing you on another one of these uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.